Welcome to the Conscious Combat Club, trauma-informed martial arts by women for women. I'm your host, Georgia, and I cannot wait to go on this journey with you. Please note that some listeners might find this content distressing. Take care, connect with your support networks, and refer to the organizations in the show notes below. Richie Hardcore is an educator, speaker, and activist working in family and sexual violence prevention, masculinities, mental health, and fitness. Richie is a retired multiple New Zealand Muay Thai champion and now works as a coach and personal trainer, having helped some of New Zealand's most successful fighters achieve their goals. Richie has lived experience and draws on this in his work and in our conversation, so please be mindful that this conversation contains discussions of family violence. I got a lot of value from this conversation and I want to make something very clear. Gender-based violence is an international crisis that cannot be addressed with a single solution. We need change and we need it yesterday. That said, the current messaging around gender seems to be effectively speaking to women and gender diverse people while pushing men and boys away. I believe that people like Richie are critical in speaking to men and boys in language that actually gets through to them and creates change. So, Richie, I was thinking about starting out by asking you, what has martial arts given you throughout your lifetime, especially in contrasting like what it did for you when you were young versus what martial arts gives you now? Actually, I think they still give me very similar things. Um... So for me, martial arts, like it has done for millions of people, has given me like a really great structure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I could, when I was young and it would like bookmark my day. So mm-hmm. start with training, go to work or go to whatever university or school, finish with training. And there's like a parameters that need to be set in order to achieve that, you know, go to bed early, Uh, make sure you eat well, uh, don't party. It gave me a really nice routine because like a lot of kids, I grew up with not a lot of that. I had quite a dysfunctional childhood. And so I really thrived within that. And and now, you know, years after I've retired from competition and I coach, um, it's similar. You know, I don't obviously, I'm not training Muay Thai twice a day, every day you know, six days a week, like I used to, but I'm still, you know, running, lifting weights, uh, coaching, I'm still hitting the bag or doing some sparring. And the the same benefit occurs from that, that structure, you know, that, that discipline, that organization, um, that's really important, not just to me, but to humans, I think. I think a lot of people really struggle with all this time and and all these feelings and thoughts and memories and there's no presence no mindfulness and um that means that people fill that with things that are often really destructive whether it's um, unhealthy relationships or too much time on social media or um, alcohol or drugs or violence in the street uh an emptiness and lack of purpose in someone's life opens them up to all of those risks. And so, yeah, I've kind of taken what I learned about discipline and routine and daily structure. And now, I, obviously, I, I have a charitable trust and work with, uh, you know, people in the justice system or kids out of school to try and share that with them, as well as self-esteem, self-discipline, like the internal stuff, you know, like uh, the positive psychological impacts of regular daily exercise and um, focusing on eating well and maintaining like a healthy body weight and staying hydrated. It's like, yo, kids, drink water, (laughs) you know? Seriously. Yeah, and (laughs) pause for water. In a in a in a in a world in a society which actively encourages you not to be healthy, like I think, I don't think it's exaggeration to say that um, most people are unhealthy. 
most people are overweight or obese. Many people, particularly young people, have mental health issues now, um, often due to the world that we expect everyone to navigate. You know, I was talking to my wife last night, and I had just come back from a play on prostitution, decriminalization by a sex worker from the American context. The night before, I was on a panel discussion with a contrary view, arguing for what's called the Nordic model. And I listened to women who had been trafficked into sex work from childhood Mm -hmm. talk about, you know, being raped by like hundreds of men over a course of years. And the day before that, I was running a rehab program working with methamphetamine addicts and people who were in the justice system. And then I was going to bed reading a book by Robert Henderson called Troubled about being in and out of foster homes. She's like, human beings aren't meant to consume that much, like suffering that's not their own. You know, like that's a lot. No, No wonder people are so anxious and stressed. And I was like, yeah this is my work and the world I live in, but our young people are doing that, waking up to TikToks of kids getting blown up in Gaza. Yeah. You know? And like, what is that doing to us? So we, so martial arts, I think, actually gives us some positive catharsis and code mechanisms and a space to switch out of all of that. Because if we don't have something like that, then we do get more anxious and angry and fall into despair. And it's real, yeah, it's really... The world's not conducive to good well-being. We have to work really hard to build things up in our daily practices. And I think the martial arts is a great way to do that for people. What do you think about just martial arts as they are versus what needs to be added to them to create really, truly impactful programs, particularly for young men? That's the work that you do, right? Because we Mm. hear a lot about how and you've described it already and I don't think it's a black and white like it's one or the other you do hear a lot about how like kickboxing saved my life martial arts saved my life that's been like the tagline of this podcast for a long time um but now I, I suppose I've been doing this work for a while I'm curious about what you think are the things that are missing that need to be brought in the conversations that need to be had what what needs to be added to what I guess the umbrella term is martial arts for development program Mm. to make them effective through the the lens of the work that you do working with young men yeah so obviously when you teach tie boxing boxing kickboxing jujitsu mixed martial arts wrestling you know contact martial arts you're teaching people to get better with an ability with violence right Mm. and so you actually have to temper that i think with proper instruction about um particularly if you're working with like vulnerable people or people with histories of personal trauma um, about self-control, self-discipline, self-esteem, context. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that all the time. You can't just do that on the the first lesson, like please don't hurt anyone at school. Mm -hmm. You you have to remind them of that and talk about some of the stuff that I think is lost in the modern transmission of martial knowledge, (laughs) right? Like... I just make this corny joke, like, you got to be like Peter Parker's uncle, you know, like Spider-Man, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. You actually actually have to teach that because, you know, I've done, I've been in combat sports for over 30 years and I've met people who have killed people by mistake in a drunken street fight, you know? And so you really don't want to recreate that for any person that you're trying to help. So I think explicit instruction from senior students and coaches is important. I think I think coaches, particularly working with young men, do need to be more mindful that they are a role model. Mm-hmm. And what are they saying about women, about um, gender relations, about violence, about athleticism, um, about alcohol and drugs, you know? A young man can turn up to the gym with a lot of problems and if the coach is like all right we'll finish training then we'll go have a few beers and then maybe go down to the strip club and you know like you're actually only helping a very superficial level with that young man right like if you're if you really are in it for helping someone develop in a holistic way 
I think it's like, oh, okay, well, how are you feeling? Um, how does that make you feel? What, what can, what, what's that open up for you when you're having these conversations, you know? Like, and then sharing some knowledge and advice in a non judgmental way is a much better way to help someone. You know, and if you don't feel equipped to have those conversations, then at least don't encourage things which are destructive. You know, I think often older men in their 30s, 40s and 50s do start waking up to the fact that alcohol, drugs, sleeping around, um, violence, you know, criminal behavior, that shit gets in the way of a good life or it ends it. So we have, I think, some degree of responsibility to help younger men learn from our mistakes or learn from our experiences and learn from our knowledge and, and, and transmit that within, within our spaces, right? Whether you're turning up to roll or hitting pads or you got sparring, you know, you know, when we go to sparring, most coaches are like, yo, mind your power, mind your, mind your mind, who you're sparring with. If you're not as good as you, you work on your defense, don't, you know, just toes up. Whoever, don't be a bully. Take that everywhere. You know, if if a guy at sparring is being a dickhead, tell them, "Hey, bro, you're going way too hard." And if and and I I don't want to I don't want to spar hard. That's giving a young person the ability to communicate their boundaries. Mm. And so, instead of just escalating that, and you know, someone hits you hard, and you get emotion emotional, and you hit them hard back, and and there's this escalation cycle, right? And then your fight mode's activated, and then before you know it, someone's hurt and can't train properly. Or, I'd pull their fight. Mm. That's a really good way to teach guys anger management. It's a really good way to teach guys how to respond to the feelings that they're noticing. And, you know, sure. And there is a time and place for competitive sparring or even hard sparring, but that doesn't make you a better fighter often. It makes you an injured one. Mm. So if you can talk through all of that with your students, then I think that's a really positively transformational. I think if you teach, I use a lot of analogies when I teach, particularly when I'm teaching with the intention of helping people who are in programs, right? Mm -hmm. You know, your stance is the roots. Your stance is your childhood. Your stance is like the foundation that everything else works from, right? You know, if you had a shitty childhood or a difficult childhood, then everything else is going to be harder, right? Um, and there's, you know, so much academic evidence that supports that or workplaces professional knowledge that's you know like that's not just a reckon you know kids need stability and structure and routine and love and support and many kids don't have that and it leads to all manner of problems and you know you can use those analogies to back and forth you know helping if you're working with older men how are your kids growing up what sort of routine structure are they having how, how what sort of stability are we helping them have what sort of emotional regulation are you teaching them you know we can back and forth between the martial arts context or the training context and the family context and it makes conversations that we often don't have or are alien to us quite relatable mm -hmm. you know you know you don't want to overdo your bench press on the first go because you get an injury and you fail right it's it's like setting these incremental goals okay maybe you've had a serious drug abuse issue if you if you have gone from smoking cannabis six days a week to five days a week, that's a that's a positive step. It's a mm -hmm. harm reduction manner. You know what I mean? You want to get stronger at your bench. Okay, you do five five at this weight for a certain amount of weeks. You have a deload period, then we step it up. You know, like you can yep. talk through that. You know, so yeah, I think martial arts is a really useful tool if you're intentional to share tangible skills with people does that mm -hmm. make sense i think it also gives men a space to talk about what's really going on in their life if other men around them are happy to be vulnerable and you actually have to role model that so this morning i'm training i was training a guy in boxing mm -hmm. and i know i know he's gone through a really long breakup with a really long-term partner and he's got a lot going on and he's a personal friend but not every man wants to go to a psychologist or a men's group or whatever right yeah but there is therapeutic outcomes that come from honest vulnerability between mm. between people 
and we just got to talking, you know, between <laughs> between sets. You know, we've done it. We've done. I'd help answer him for you know, a bunch of rounds, and then I know he's got stuff going on. How's it going? Not an open, not a not like a yes no, but like an open question. You know, how's it going? He doesn't pay me to be a therapist, but I want him to be okay. Yeah, and and, and we have some really nice chat and just letting him talk freely. There's therapy in that. Does it, does that make sense? It does. And, and it, that relational strength is really good for anyone. So mm-hmm. a lot of people walk around with breakups, with mental health struggles, with financial struggles, with stress, and bottle it all up, and that comes out somehow, you know. Mm-hmm. And often it's violence, drugs, car accidents. So how do we help people take the volume turn the volume down inside themselves in a healthy way it's not just suppressing it you know yeah so there's like a twofold thing there he comes he exercises he's present he learns a skill and there's this therapeutic engagement through open conversation peer support you know and I, i think all coaches can do that if they have some skills and training around that and a mindfulness to do that alternatively i could have been like Oh yeah, well, fuck, get on Tinder. You could hook up with some new checks, sweet bro. You know, a hundred percent. And I think what you said at the start, right, about the the um, the knowledge sharing is not going to land if you're saying things like, you know, like let's look after each other, don't be a bully. If you don't also genuinely live those kind of values, mm. the coach then turns around and they spar hard with hard with anyone, or they spar hard if, as soon as somebody seems like they're kind of land a couple techniques they have to like assert their their top of the pecking orderness and you know they push back and they're doing behaviors that aren't resonant with the message that they're they're trying to share um that and and that must take you know some work to get to a point where you're you're there right because it's not that easy not to have your ego take over all the time you know the ego is always there. Oh, totally. Like, I'm 44 and I retired from fighting 11 years ago. But sometimes I'll be sparring a new guy and he'll like whack me hard. And I feel it come up. Like the old me will mm. come up. And like I'm still fit enough to put it on some people. And I have to work really hard. And I've, don't get me wrong, I've messed up sometimes. Like someone will hurt me hard and I'm like, do you want to spar hard? And they go, yep. And I'm like, all right, let's go, you know. And, and, mm. At least we've had that engagement because I've articulated my desire to be competitive. But then sometimes I've, you know, over the years, probably gone a bit over the top in that and been like, oh, hey, look, I'm sorry that how I, you know what I mean? So it's been a process for me. Um, And sometimes dudes are into it. Like young men do need to like test and go through, I think, this pathway into adulthood or manhood and the confines of the gym can be a really good place to do that better better in the gym than in the street right definitely definitely better in the gym than in the street but also important to have a model for other ways that you can handle when the intensity goes up similarly to um i think running men's groups and and we're seeing more now like finally um conversations around how do we talk to men in a way that makes sense to them yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, about gender and about vulnerability and about all these things that we've said do not fall under the category of masculine or man right and you also can't have that conversation coming from someone who who doesn't believe it, it there's not a chance that that's going to stick and in fact maybe saying nothing but just being vulnerable my sense is that 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 might even be more effective that's something i'm really excited to talk to you about today is how you're helping these young men reframe their idea about what what masculinity means yeah entirely i mean yeah you're right like if you're talking in the language of like intersectionality and social justice academic jargon and you've never been in a fist fight and you've never seen anyone get hurt or grown up with all this like people have a massive bullshit detector and you're actually doing a disservice to any sort of program. I think if, if you're out there like, blah, 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 you know what I mean? Like, mm. 
you know, I've been running peer support for men from like really serious offenders, long-term lifetime gang members the last three, four weeks. Yeah. And uh, it's like a, it's like a more entrenched cohort of people. Normally I'm working with younger people who haven't gone so far down the road, but these men have been to prison like 20 times, you know, and it's actually been awesome because I was, I used to really over academic, okay what's the word of intellectualize things because that's how i do things and i'm like well i've been to university and i've done all this work and i have blah blah blah. and then i got asked to talk about some things which aren't in my academic or professional training and wheelhouse and i was like oh i'm not sure if i'm like qualified although Mm -hmm. i've got like lots of lived experience around a b and c but I pitched it uh, in like, look, speaking from this amount of professional, this amount of personal, you know, like it just became like an honest peer support conversation without mm-hmm. giving didactic answers. And the, the people who I've been working with really respond super well to it. And we've just opened up, it just really opened up space for them to share, I think, it, because they've been living inside themselves so hard with you know tattoos and gangs and violence and like you know intergenerational trauma very realistically and you know these men that i don't i've not spent a lot of time with were telling me about their daughter's suicide attempts and all this really intense stuff and then also like opening up really publicly with the group around other things and questions and it's been really awesome but that's because i've preloaded the conversation with my own mistakes like mm. I, when i first started speaking about social issues over 20 years ago i didn't put my own mistakes into it because sometimes i even hadn't had them because i was young you know like what the fuck do you know about life or marriage or death when you're 23 sometimes a lot right sometimes not much at all and I get do I do get very frustrated with online social justice activisms activists and their activism speaking from this haughty place of academic or professional knowledge without the tempering of wisdom. D- d- mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Because I, it, it it really does the broader work a disservice. You know, if I go and speak at a school like a high school. It's not martial arts based, it's more educational. And you and you do a good job, boys will come up and be like, Oh, thanks for speaking like that. I really need to come from a man. I would never would have listened to this, or people these people have come, or this organization came. And they really just made us feel like shit. They really made us feel judged or attacked and like made me feel bad or made us feel bad. And you know, that's the whole appeal of like Andrew Tate and some of those really unhealthy neo-masculinist traditional masculinity sort of blogs and voices is they are picking up all these boys who've been disaffected by um that whole online men are trash crowd you know which which still was you know part of the sector you know a lot of like online social justice activism just doesn't appeal to like the majority of dudes and it actually pushes them away from the chat and so you need to own you need to own your own failings and say we're all on this journey together. I'm a bit older than you, I'm a bit more experienced than you, but I've been where you are. These are the mistakes I've made and how they hurt me and hurt the people around you or around me. Mm. And kids and men both want to have that, you know what I mean? When you try and when you try and put yourself above someone, it doesn't really work. Yeah, and I think this is what we've seen. Jess Hill, I've noticed lately, has been speaking out about um, just how the, a lot of the narrative is skewed to one population. And it's not that it's not important to have those conversations. All the work that I do is on the recovery end of the spectrum, and it's working with women to recover from predominantly men's violence. But we can't have 100% of the story for half of the people, especially when as a generalization, half of the people aren't the perpetrators, right? That most oftentimes they're going to be the victims. It's really important that we break the cycle on their end. But when we're talking about then talking to men, it's almost as if 
you can't have the conversation because it, there's a, a disconnect, but it's the same as that the way that I would write something if I was explaining it for a grant application versus for a peer reviewed paper versus for a blog that the average person was going to read needs to be different. We've got different audiences. Um, and now that social media really silos everybody as well into you see and based on an algorithm and the algorithm is going to keep showing you more of what it thinks that you want. Then we've started to create these, um, I guess, silos whereby, you know, maybe the, the odd person, I would say maybe the odd man's coming across some of the content, they're immediately put off by it because it's not for them at all, right? It's not mm, really, mm. in mind at all. If nobody's writing this content saying, I hope men see this and they're just shamed into doing something different and that's what's going to change the world. I don't think anybody genuinely believes that. They are acting knowing that like this is going to land with my audience, which is mm. maybe predominantly women-led audience. Um, but they're not realizing that just in the same way that if you comment something on a celebrity post, that celebrity's never going to see it. But if it's me, best believe your friends will see it because mm. that's what's going to be pushed to the top of their feed. It's kind of a similar thing, right? Where then the what you have there's there's a void. And like you say, Andrew Tate and people like that are filling that avoid right now and and that's why the government had in australia at least has really pushed to say we need men's programs we need programs like the man cave to fit the other end of the spectrum because it's not it's not only one half the other half is just as important significantly important and we've been yakking on about how important prevention is forever but not being like well maybe we need some other voices or some other strategies yeah you need multiple voices saying things parallel right and in different ways you know like uh yeah you're totally right you know obviously women have led this conversation for a long time because they are the victims of violence sexual yeah. harassment family violence um you know rape childhood sexual abuse women are disproportionately affected by all of those things and men are unequivocally the biggest perpetrators of those things and yet most men are not perpetrators Mm. So how do we have that conversation and how do we help boys and men understand that they're part of the solution and appeal to their, their ethics and appeal to the goodness that I see in most boys and men? Because as so long as we keep saying all men are trash, all men are violent, you know, the way someone like Clementine Ford does, like it's who's got a huge audience and produces a lot of content that gets understandably victimized woman agreeing with these more and more extreme takes like we're not going to get in you know like we're not going to get to the solution that's why mm -hmm. I, that's why i love jess hill's work because it's very pragmatic and she's like yeah, what do we do how do we call dudes in you know what i mean how do we get all these different voices to acknowledge the issues but then work together rather than opposition i feel mm -hmm. like at you have just like more and more extreme voices screaming across the divide and it's not helping anyone. It's, and it, it's really frustrating, you know, having been around this for, you know, over 20 years now, or if I card my childhood, someone who grew up with family harm, you know, like my whole life, like, mm -hmm. It's, it, you know, sometimes I get so frustrated. It's like we're having the same thing again and again and again and again. You know, it's like, you know, I think statistically there's a slight reduction in family harm rates in Australia, last I read. But um, we're not actually sure why that is. We're not actually sure. Is, are our programs working? Blah, 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 you know? So how do we figure out what is working and what isn't? And then if you look at, like, sexual violence and sexual harassment, there's really high rates of that still if yeah. not um i'm a little i haven't checked the latest statistics but i imagine due to the increased awareness and we've got more reporting so higher rates i imagine perhaps you could help me on the data there yeah i i don't think they have a clear answer to that it would be people speculating to say that it might yeah. be that it's um higher rates due to increased reporting because i think that reporting is still significantly low relative to what the the reality of it is because there's still so much stigma of course you know um 
and I think you know like you're so bang on that there just needs to be more more conversations more diverse conversations and also like the first uh, Jess Hill was the first person to really like speak to me in a way where I was like patriarchy is messed up for everybody you know it's really messed up for mm -hmm. the men who get told from a young age like you're not allowed to cry you know you've got to be tough all the time like that that doesn't make anybody feel great you know and I think these conversations not from just like do this because you're a good citizen which like is true people should be be a good person just to be a good person but we are wired to be self-serving first and foremost as a protective strategy just like many of the things our brains do by default so how do we have conversations that make sense to people firstly but also that um you know are, are benefiting them so i'd love to hear from you because i think we just don't hear that much about this like what are some of the things that come out when you get to be in a space where men get to be vulnerable and what are some of the ways that that then goes on to positively impact their lives when they do come at everything not just that one conversation but they're able to step more into vulnerability which i'm using it as an umbrella term to kind of counteracting what i would call that like the what we get taught as being what masculinity mm -hmm. the opposite of vulnerability but i could be wrong there. no i think i think it i mean it's a, tr it's a tricky answer because it depends on who you're working with right i think some i think some of our younger men are actually far more aware of these conversations and they are stepping outside some of these traditional expectations of masculinity and they're cool with it right and i think that's emerged a lot through our mental health discourse you mm -hmm. know that they're they're all right the conversation it's not weak to speak is it it's been really good at helping shift this sort of narrative for, for a while yeah but but that said who kills himself the most yeah you know like young men i you know and, and then and then older men too like in new zealand um uh, young Māori men uh, are twice as likely to commit suicide as young Pākehā men. But then second on that list of who takes their own lives is older European men, often living in, you know, rural settings. And it, and I would argue that, yeah, there are there's similar cultural drivers but different personal histories that keep boys and men stuck in this inability to ask for help, express, you know, develop coping tools that aren't alcohol, drugs, violence, et cetera, mm. that emotional oppression. So for me, you know, when I, I used to kind of speak to people with this very forthright, feminist informed tone. Yeah. And like and and it was very popular with feminists, but it wasn't popular with boys and men and young people and yeah. it was kind of like hard to decipher you know it was hard to interpret in hindsight it was well intentioned uh, you know I was talking about like rape culture and the the the, the pyramid of violence and mm -hmm. you know all of this but I, I I I realized through a range of means that part of my actual work was beholden to this concept of audience capture and that I was speaking to what people already agreed with me, wanted to hear and like to hear. And I was like, ah, oh, that's actually not the work. The work isn't being celebrated for saying the right things. The work is having very thorny, gray, difficult chats, primarily offline, but also online mm -hmm. to work with boys and men. And to do that, you actually, I actually have <laughs> like lot online lost followers or whatever, because I'm not speaking to this audience anymore. I'm mm. talking to fucking regular dudes. So I swear I talk in a way that I talk how I would talk in the gym. Yeah. You know, and um, what I've noticed is that I'm exponentially more connecting with dudes, mm -hmm. particularly hard to reach me. It's like I'm, work I'm working with men who have done like terrible things sometimes now. And if I talked to I did 10 years ago, it wouldn't work at all. Even with my work in schools, you know, I've talked to like tens of thousands of students now across Australia and New Zealand and even America once <laughs> in an online thing. And like how I talked 10 years ago to how I talk now, man, I'm good at, I'm great, I'm great at it now. Back then in my formative sort of 
work well-intentioned but gets the tone wrong right and I, I still think a lot of people are back here in the space mm -hmm. not not in a I'm not saying in a haughty way but I think a lot of people who are, who are inexperienced or only come at it from a professional academic sense and they can't temper that with the lived experience as well they're, they're kind of losing losing the target market does that make sense so it's like you say like maybe it's not designed to be doing the work and that's cool but mm. I'll, go, I'll go on linkedin and see like all these professionals in the space with these statistics and these this outrage and this drama and blah 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 and I think some of it is intended to be change making. And I'm like, bruh, <laughs> like no one is going to read this and go, that's it. We have to change. It just, it's not even going to register. It's going to be scrolled past or it'll be annoying. And like, it'll be galvanizing to push back on a, on an emotional reactionary sense. Because that's what social, social media can do to us. Right. Mm. So it's, it's like. I think we need to help each other figure out who's my audience, how am I speaking with them? If I'm not the person to do it, how do I help someone do it who who does? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it so, does. So I'm really grateful to have worked with the, our Ministry of Social Development for a long time in New Zealand. And, you know, I do some professional work and professional development with emergent grassroots groups. And I get to share sort of the stuff I'm talking with you now. This is what we know hegemonic masculinity is. This is, these are the drivers of family harm, but how do we talk about it in a way that's relatable and understandable to disparate groups, right? How you talk to this group isn't the same as how you talk to this group. You figure it out. You're the people in the community. You know the language, the tools, the cultural touch points. I might not, but here are the broader, you know, professional understandings that we all, I think, need to be aware of. But then you go out, you chew that up and, and reshare that in a way that's digestible for your people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Does that make sense to you? It does. And I'd love to hear if you've got, you might not have one off the top of your head. Do you have an example of like how you know that that has landed for um, like a person that you've been working with? Is there an example of something someone's come back to you and said like at the end of the session or like even better, like a little while later where you're like, we're getting through to this person oh entirely i think any sort of self-disclosure means that you have connected with a person yeah so i don't know i was over in australia a couple of years ago and i was at um good thing good things festival yeah and um some young lads come up and like yo we saw i tied in i tied in my work trip with this festival right oh i think i want to see the amity affliction or someone play and uh these young lads come up to me and they'd, they'd seen me speak at, uh, I think, St. Joseph's College or something up in Geelong. And like, yeah. mate, they were like, mate, you you are awesome. <laughs> I'm trying to do it, be in Australia. You're awesome, mate. Need to come from a bloke. You know, like, really like what you had to say. And I was like, oh, yo, you know, like, you know, I, I think I probably had my shirt off at a top festival covered in tattoos. And these yeah. dudes came up and I'd been talking about sex and violence and porn and what's teaching us. And they wanted to share that it really resonated with them yeah and, and and these were not political kids they, these were just regular lads and that was that i was stoked on that you know I, my social media now is full of dms from often boys and men and women too who are like mate i really like what you're talking about and how you talk about it, it means a lot i've done this this and this those stories and i screenshot them sometimes i've got like a positive feedback folder yeah that, that makes me stoked and it makes me constantly be mindful of how I'm communicating or even, you know, this week on Tuesday, you know, um, older man been in and out of prison. We we're talking about, we do an hour of Muay Thai and then we do like two minutes of silent or three minutes silent breathing. Mm -hmm. I'll talk them through like a basic, like, mindfulness breathing exercise and the breathing's way harder than doing an hour of muay thai <laughs> yeah well actually it's amazing how quiet they all go now yeah and we have to turn our phones off or on silent and just put your hand on your stomach you know and like i'm like okay if you're coming back to the corner after a two minute round i'm going to pull your shorts out and ask you to breathe through into your stomach and bring your heart rate down mm. it's a really it's a really basic de-escalation technique we do that and then we do like a 45 minute corridor around 
think the first week we looked at masculinity. The second week we looked at sex, porn, sexual assault, and this week we talked about mental health. And I get into breakout into little workshop groups, and it's pretty cool, man. And then this older dude he was like, um, "My daughter tried to commit suicide, and I promised her that I'll get off the gear." And I love the gear. Like he was like really like I love meth. I love the meth life. Which from someone watching this is like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, but like within the context of the people I'm working with in that group, this is a very like high needs, high risk group. That was such a normal thing. Like, but he said to me, uh, uh, I love my daughter, then I love methamphetamine. Mm. And, uh, and I'm five months clean. And I haven't been back to prison. And I was just like, like this dude was in his 50s, I think. And he and his daughter and him had were like reconnecting after mm -hmm. the suicide attempt. And for him to open up in our group chat like that was such a thrill for me that I was on the way to getting that tone right. Do you, do you know what I mean? You know, because you know, I open up like I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist. You know, my my academic training is in sociology. Like, I, I'm, you know, I have a master's degree in sociology, and another degree in political science, and and um, you know, professional background and preventative approaches to alcohol and drug harm. And I guess I'm okay at speaking like that. But what resonates with these men is talking in just day to day language. Yeah. And 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 sharing my own stories. Yeah, my you know, back in this period of my life, my girlfriend was cheating on me and she got pregnant and she was cheating on me while she was pregnant. And I felt like killing myself. And when I can be open like that, they're like, oh fuck, the brother's been there, you know? Oh yeah, what did you do to get better? And then I can talk through evidential ways of mental health recovery. Yeah that have a host of literature behind it, but they feel rather than think about, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think we can all do that in our own ways. Yeah, hell yeah. We are rapidly running out of time and I am heartbroken about it. Um, so we might have to get you back and do this again sometime, but before you go, um, the audience of this podcast is I'm gonna say predominantly women predominantly martial artists and there are a lot of coaches that listen to this so do you have a message for coaches particularly coaches who do work with mixed gender um or that work with men in what they could be doing to do you know even just some small amount of what you've been doing through your your work i think just little and often is a good approach mm -hmm. I think if we're always lecturing people, which is what I did in my well-meaning 20s, I was just like telling people off, you know, like, you know, I'm older. So like before like wokeness was a thing, I was woke, you know, and I was a painful scold. And I look back on that and cringe deeply with shame, you know, like for that period of my life. I think, as I've matured and as I've healed my very real difficult experiences from a messy childhood, I've been able to do the work better. So I think first and foremost, work on yourself. Yeah. Like if your lens mm -hmm. of experience actually fixed yourself and then you can carry that work that is experiences with you and they inform your practice, but they're not shaping how you talk. Because I see so many people talking from a place of anger and unresolved trauma. And you start just building a bubble of people around you who are also similarly angry and have unresolved trauma. And then we live in this time where everything's ideological now. And so you get like a very politicized, traumatized group of people talking about, say, sexual violence prevention in a way that just doesn't resonate with most people boys and men if that's your target audience almost mm -hmm. almost people you know so working yourself first little and often i think is good you know mm -hmm. what i mean when i say to one of my students in class is it cool if i um and i do i do this this is a thing 
if I say, hey, bro, I'm going to grab you in the head. I'm going to grab you in the neck to demonstrate clinch. Is that cool? In front of like 20 other young dudes. And he goes, yeah, all good. And I turn around and say, see, boys, consent, fucking easy. <laughs> you know, like, they're, they're like, oh. I'm like, no, nah, for real. You know, like, <laughs> if you want to put your hand on your girlfriend's head while she gives you a blowjob, you just have to ask. And they're like, they'll, <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? Yes. And um, they're like, oh, and it's just saying that. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, little and often, humor is good. And um, be open to learning and meet people where they are rather than expect them to come to you. you like, you have to be inviting. Yeah. You, know, you have to let, uh, you know, I've had to let men know that it's better for us to have a broader more expansive idea of masculinity so i preface everything with who kills himself the most boys and men who experiences homicide and assault the most boys and men who dies in car accidents the most boys and men who ends up in jail most boys and men and i can recount countless stories of pe people i know and care about who have killed themselves killed someone in car accidents ended in prison killed someone um who is the victim of sexual violence the most women and girls who changes the way they walk home clothes that they wear the times they go out women and girls who isn't safe or feels they aren't safe to do activities a b and c women and girls at the expense of you know what i mean due to masculine behavior the drivers of all of these things are, are, are often quite similar when we yeah. think about male gender roles, when you think about male expectations, when you think about lived histories culminating in violence, the answer of our collective liberation is multifaceted. It's not just a reconstruction of what we believe hegemonic masculinity to be. That is a big part of it. There are class issues, you know, there are economic issues, which I yeah. think often have been sidelined by you know, uh, neoliberal identitarianism and identity politics. You don't talk about class anywhere near enough as we should. You know, there are a whole range of issues here, mental health issues, addiction issues, you know, access to substances issues. I can't fix all of that, but I'm sitting here with you now working with you about this part of it, and I'd love it if you did it with me. Yeah. Because I have two sons. And I don't want them to grow up with the same pressures that I grew up with. And they're beautiful boys. I love my son so much that I I see that in everyone else who's got sons, you know. And then you all have daughters, my brothers, you know what I mean? Whether you're in a kickboxing class with young people, you can't say they're going to be a father, bro. You know, whether you're playing on it or not, you know. And, 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 and what sort of world do you want your kids to grow up in? You know, like. I think appealing to men's empathy, young men or older men, mm. and their their ethics and their higher selves is great rather than shaming them mm -hmm. and, and attacking them and blaming them. Because um, that doesn't work for anyone. So anyone listening to this, I would argue, you know, temper your approach. Are you saying these things to be seen, to be saying these things? Or are you saying them because you want to be Mm, effective mm -hmm. uh, i think a lot of social justice culture is very performative and it's very clout chasey and uh ineffective and polarizing and i think you know i was saying this to my friend the other day i don't really have time at the moment to like make all the content that i want to make <laughs> you know what i mean i'm so busy working with people mm. no one sees all the shit and that's, I'm fucking cool with that, you know, like when I was younger, a lot of it was an unconscious search for validation. And now I'm older and have grown up. I'm like, yeah, fuck it. I'm not the coolest guy on the internet anymore, whatever. I'm working with dudes and they're telling me about this shit. And I go home tonight and kiss my kids and that's fucking rad, you know, like so much cooler than, I don't know. Oh, I lost a hundred followers or whatever. I said something that someone didn't agree with. Who gives a fuck? Yeah. It's not really a change happens, man. 
for people who do want to follow you i'm so i'm so conscious of the time now um for people who do want to follow you online or connect with you find out when you're coming to australia we've spoken about this we need mm. to be back here how do we get in touch with you online um you can check out my website hello uh no just richieharco.com it's in need of a little update but you know you can contact me there you can email me hello richieharco.com you can check out my charitable trust and if you have lots of money and you want to um give me a building to run programs from it's rise above um yeah, rise at rise above trust.com mm -hmm. uh and i'm on instagram it's my favorite platform at Richie Hardcore. I have threads, that's right. And I have Facebook as well. Just all that Richie Hardcore. R I C H I E, no T in my Richie. No hey, T in my Richie is key. Yeah. I that too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, nice to talk to you, George. Yeah, I really love what you're doing with your, your platform. And um, yeah, I really I think you're I think you're rad. So thank you for having me as a guest on your show. It's my pleasure. Like I said, I think we'll we'll get you back. I'd love to see you in some sort of like a panel conversation. I think the more we can bring everyone and try and find common ground in our conversations, mm. um, the better off the world is going to be. Yeah, I totally agree, man. We need to agree to disagree on some things and look at a big structure. So I'm glad that we're on the same page. <laughs> Peace. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for being part of the club. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to get in touch, please refer to the information in the show notes. If you'd like to support this podcast, please consider leaving us a review or subscribing on whichever platforms you use to listen or watch the podcast. The Conscious Combat Club acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands in which we work, live and play. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We'd like to say thank you to Nari for the beautiful song Shape Me, heard at the beginning and end of every episode. Nobody shapes me. If you'd like to connect with but Nari, you can find her on Instagram at Nari the Saga. Don't gotta tell you what my name is, I don't gotta explain it. Walk in the room, hear a boom erupting like I'm famous. I'm here shedding shells, I'm shameless. I fear nothing, no complacence. Walk to many tight ropes with no hope, so I became this poster they hold over all the heads of trauma holders. You don't need to know my history, I move boulders. Atlas shrug, cause I lifted the weight above his shoulders. No pretense of defense, move first like chess soldiers. This goes deeper than empowerment, cause huh, I'm the one to power it. Physical meets mental challenge me to keep devouring If I can't change the scenery, at least I change perspectives No longer isolated, but elevated and selective Darkest places become beautiful spaces This is where rage meets patience Meets power meets gracious Meets we're so glad you came in the feeling is contagious When you the walking impact of intended bad intentions When you the manifest enough collecting all they tensions You the soul and body hold it all and still remember But I'm a work in progress testament to all contenders Forgot what it was like to have control over self Forgot what it was like to be the one in charge Forgot in my reflection I could see all my wealth Forgot that with my bare hands I break all these bars Barriers and obstacles They can't cage me They can't chronicle all my, all my experiences And reduce them to appearances When I was truly beaten Gave myself clearances to fall down Mess up and get myself back up I'm not looking for clovers Cause I don't believe in luck Damn you were badass I heard them say it clearly Why thank you very much I know now I'm not weary Of what's next for me Cause I expect to see Growth like I was planted Watered, fed, and bloomed To be the positivity And accountability Knowing they won't step If I'm the agent of my agency I think I found my voice again, huh? I think I found my voice again, huh? I'm not sorry, I'm not sorry, you're the end where I begin Boundaries, I know them well, take a breath and meditate Who is she? I know her well, now I get to open gates One, two, one, two, I don't need your permission And if you get uncomfortable, then use your intuition To know that I won't stay where respect is ever missing And everything I do, that's me making decisions It's truly underrated, the value of self-worth Forgot that I was rich from the moment of my birth A penny for my thoughts, no really, you can't afford it You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it, huh?